before I welcome you to this special service of thanksgiving for Godfrey's life. I first of all want to read just some verses from the Bible, some wonderful verses of scripture uh, that express a faith that Godfrey owned, uh, that Godfrey held, uh, and this great love for the Lord that he had. So let me read these verses of scripture. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die yet, shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Who can separate us from the love of God? For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. For the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said this, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Well, first of all, on behalf of Christine and indeed all the family, welcome to this special service of thanksgiving for Godfrey's life. Welcome to all of you who are in here. Welcome to you who are in the front hall. Uh, welcome to you also who are watching this service wherever you are from home uh, this afternoon. And just a special welcome to Nathan and Joe uh, and to Johnny as well. Uh, thank you for being with us in the way that you are today. Following the family graveside service yesterday, we're meeting here together as family, as friends, in the name of Jesus, the one who loved us, the one who died for us, the one who was raised to life to the glory of God the Father, the one whom Godfrey came to know and to love and whose presence made all the difference in the world to his life. In this service of thanksgiving today, we're here to give thanks to God for Godfrey's life, for the rich way that it touched all those around him as he lived a life full of Christ. So we're here to give God thanks. We're here also to encourage one another, to encourage one another in the hope that we have uh, in and through Christ, but also to comfort one another in the reality of feeling the sorrow and the loss of one so deeply loved. So, again, on behalf of Christine and the family, welcome. And you are all warmly invited to stay on following the service here for some refreshments that will be in different places. We'll explain that later. And also, just to say, if you feel you would like to give a donation today, these will go to the Motor Neuro and Disease Association, who have supported Godfrey in his illness in, uh, in an amazing way, and also to the Barnabas Fund. This is a, an organization that supports persecuted Christians around the world, and it was a charity close to Godfrey's heart. So you will, if you've not noticed, there's a basket here uh, and actually out in the foyer near to the main doors as you came in if you would like to make a donation today. So let's begin 
our service of thanksgiving then with a wonderful opening hymn that we have. Perhaps uh, we'll not be surprised to know that Godfrey chose the hymns today uh, and through all that he thought and prepared and prayed for this service, we see and hear his heart and his faith and his love for the Lord Jesus uh, and this faith anchored in God, his Father. So uh, it's in his loving presence we meet today. So as you're able, let's stand and sing this opening hymn, To God Be the Glory. going to pray for a moment just before Hannah comes to share words of a eulogy this afternoon. So let's pray for a moment. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for something of your heart that we have already captured in the words of this hymn, this great invitation, O come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. Father, we thank you even at the outset of our service for your wonderful love and grace towards Godfrey, uh, for this love that was poured into his heart and his life. And Father, thank you that even today in this place, gathered in the name of Jesus, we too may experience and know the love of our Heavenly Father and his grace towards us in his Son. And we pray, Lord, that through the presence of your Holy Spirit today, every part of this service may honor you in all your goodness. Father, we pray for Hannah as she comes to share. 
We pray for every part of this. It was all who are going to be involved. We pray that together we may know your presence filling us and ministering and sharing your heart with us, even as we thank you for all that you've done in Godfrey's life. We commit this service to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hannah. I'm not going to look too much at you because I keep seeing different people that set me off in, um, in the room right now. But um, we uh, reiterate what Michael was saying. We're so grateful that you're here, so thankful that you come and celebrate Dad's life with us. There was, um, uh, right at the end of his life, he, he left behind a little pot of morphine that we were all slightly tempted to have a, a little swig of this morning just to get us through the day. But um, I, I at least didn't. I'm not sure about anyone else. But um, I managed to resist. Um, um, but we're here to uh, celebrate his life. And um, I'm going to read the eulogy. And, uh, you know, I was thinking, there's so many of us that have been in parts of his life uh, and seen different aspects. Um, uh, not many of us have been in the whole thing. And uh, we're just going to celebrate that right now and, and read a little bit of his full life together. Um, Dad was born on the 21st of November, 1948. Kids, that feels a little bit of a long time ago, right? 1948. In um, Redreath Hospital. Um, he was the second son of Hilary and Clifford Higgins. Youngest son to Alan. Youngest son, even youngest brother to Alan. Um, his dad was a local preacher. And his mum and dad were committed Christians. Dad was very much brought up in the faith uh, that they walked in and they lived out. The Methodist Church and its uh, rich history was something that dad, uh, was somewhere that dad inherited his rich, uh, his, uh, his deep love for hymns and for uh, the hymns of Wesley and others um, in his life. He often quoted them. I'm sure some of you heard him reel off by memory a whole, a whole hymn uh, in a way that um, used to astound us. And um, even in his last days, uh, we got to gather around his bedside um, and sing him hymns. It was a little bit harder without him there because he was always the one that led us. So it was like, we need you right now. But, um, but we did that. And even in those last moments, his, his hand would tap. Not much else was going on, but his hand would tap, and one would come on that he liked, and his thumb would go up, like, yes, this one. And um, so they were really precious moments right to the end for him. Uh, in school, he uh, loved most subjects. English was his favorite, and uh, I don't know if you've ever been in his study and seen all of his books or listen to one of his sermons that he carefully crafted, or listen to his poetry, you'll know that that love for English and that love for words carried on the rest of his life, really. And um, uh, something he continued to enjoy. And uh, around about the age of nine, I think he, he says that his heart was particularly warmed to the things of God, particularly alive to them. And for his 10th birthday, he wanted a hymn book, which is kind of not the normal thing for a 10-year-old to want, but he wanted a hymn book for um, his birthday or Christmas that year. And the next year, he wanted a Bible. Um, again, maybe unusual for a 10-year-old to want, but he just remembers talking to God and having a relationship with God at that young age. Um, by grammar school uh, in the 60s. Uh, however, his focus changed a little bit, and uh, he often kind of expressed regret at like a period of time where God wasn't center of his life, and his choices and the things he did maybe weren't, weren't what he would have chosen in later life. Um, I'm sure some of you can, uh, some of us can appreciate that journey too. Uh, during that time, he developed a fascination with all things mechanical, um, at 16, he took up a five-year um, engineering apprenticeship at Holman's Brothers in Camborne. 
His technical studies were in engineering production, the study of machine tools, and everything connected with manufacturing. And, uh, you know, this week, as I've looked at the various houses we've been in, at the dismantled electric cars and all of that kind of thing, I think probably there's some grandchildren who are going to follow in these footsteps of uh, mechanical stuff and that kind of thing, which is not a bad thing. Um, at 17, he, he remembers his life significantly being changed when he went to the loft. Some of you from the loft remember those days, a youth meeting, again in Redruth, where he uh, used to attend. And uh, he would say his in initial motive for going there was more uh, the, the girls that went along at the same time. Um, but uh, he says that there... It was that moment uh, when he used to go there that he began to understand the truths of God just a little bit better. And uh, he, when he was writing about his own life, he talks about a time where he remembers an evangelist coming and uh, reading, um, speaking from Ephesians 2, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It's a gift from God, not a result of work, so no one may boast. And uh, he remembers this being like an epiphany moment for him, one where kind of his heart came alive and uh, where he realized that God wasn't going to weigh up his good and his bad deeds at the end of his life uh, and see whether, you know, where he was going to go. Um, something that he was slightly, he talks about being anxious uh, of wondering uh, what was going to happen with that. But he said that night he had a revelation of the extravagant grace of God the extravagant grace of God, that though his kind of shortcomings in his own life, he was really aware where kind of separated him from God, he, he had that revelation of the power of the life of Jesus and his death and resurrection made heaven possible, made relationship with God possible, made life possible for him. And he went on to make a public kind of profession of faith at a Youth for Christ rally, something that one of some of you will remember as well in Red Reef. And his life would never be the same. His life would never be the same. God and his love for people, uh, the people he created, would be a message that he would feel compelled to tell people for the rest of his life. Those who listened and those who didn't want to listen as well. He would do that. Everything from then on was motivated probably by his faith in God. He motivated by his faith in God. He learned to play the guitar so that he could sing songs about his faith. He taught in the local Sunday school. Our dad was a focused man. Any of you met him, know him well. He was focused. He was intentional. He, he knew where he was going. And uh, it was at the loft where he met mom. And fell in love with what he would describe as a beautiful, shy, mysterious 16-year-old. I have 16 year Oh, I have a 15 and a 17-year-old. That makes me a bit nervous. Um, uh, fell in love um, with her. And he would say that as well as kind of the outward attraction to her, he fell in love with the inner person of who she was. And uh, the... Um, I've done... Turn two pages instead of one. Um, her character, her modest character, her sincere faith in God. That's what attracted him. And after three years of courtship, uh, they were married. And their adventure of nearly 50 years, nearly 50 years of marriage together would begin. Their life passion, their direction would be wholeheartedly to serve those around them. To nurture and to disciple to care for the lonely, the hurting, the broken, those in need of hope, and the answer to life's questions. Many of you have encountered this side of their lives. Uh, and that's probably why you're here to get today, some of you. Uh, and I, I know that because we've written, we've read the, the copious number of cards that have come through the mail uh, to mum's mom's house uh, this, this week. Uh, I would say hundreds of cards that have come through saying, I remember a time where your dad did this and he stopped for me. I remember a time where I was in crisis and there was this one phrase that he said to me and it changed my life. Uh, it's been humbling and amazing and special to read those stories and those moments. That's who he was. 
and uh, he had a love and a strength that you could glean from him. And he would always point you to Jesus as the answer to your struggles. He would always point you to Jesus as the answer to your struggles. And whether it was leading youth groups or preaching in local churches or having people live in the family home or have the most extraordinary people around for dinner um, or camping with teenagers or picking up hitchhikers, every now and again we would get in the car and there would be a mysterious blanket on the chair next to, on the kind of passenger seat. We'd be like, Dad, why is there a blanket on the passenger seat? And it'd be like, I picked someone up. And uh, there would be moments where you're like, okay. I actually went on to marry one of those hitchhikers that he picked up, so they were not all bad. And um, so, um, yeah, uh, that, that was a special thing. Um, but his motivation was always the same. You know, he encountered a God that had changed his life, and he wanted others to know him too. He'd encountered a God that changed his life, and he wanted others to know him too. For mum and dad, their first year in marriage uh, was spent in Cardiff, where mum finished her degree, and dad completed his engineering studies. After that, they uh, returned to to Cornwall, and uh, Danny was born shortly after, and then Rachel and I, a little bit after that, where's Rachel? There. And um, and then Marie, a little later. (laughs) Um, Dad would continue working um, now as a product engineer in Compo Maxam, a time where he'd become highly uh, successful, respected, and valued in his field of expertise. But then after uh, 20 years of engineering, he began to sense a call um, from God to study for for the ministry, for Christian ministry. So leaving his secure and stable realms of uh, his previous employment, He began a four-year distance learning course that would require a faith to provide for us as a family financially um, at a time of no regular income. But I remember, uh, we remember God providing for us amazingly in those days as they stepped out to pursue what they felt was the call of God on their lives. During this time, he began preaching here in Halston at the the Baptist church that was newly formed there. And at the end of their studies, um, they asked him to become their pastor. And he'd serve here in Halston for another uh, seven years. And then just after Christmas, 1996, still feels a little long ago, doesn't it, guys? Um, 1996, he caught the flu on Christmas, back in a day where flu was a thing. Flu, you know, used to be around. Um, uh, and he, he, um, he got flu, and then he just didn't recover from that bout of flu. And that went on to uh, be diagnosed with something called chronic fatigue syndrome, otherwise known as ME. And uh, it would completely shut his body down for a good while. He was unable to work, which you can imagine for someone who loved to serve and loved to be in the center of uh, doing stuff for other people. That's it. it was a hard time for his life. It was a hard time for his life. And, um, uh, and after about two years uh, um, of uh, that illness, he, and trying to return to the ministry, he, he resigned with a hope that kind of being away from ministry might be something that would help him recover a little bit um, uh, for, for the future. Um, Mum and dad continued, however, to be involved with people wherever they found themselves led to be. Always encouraging, always loving, always investing in those in front of them um, at the time of need, kind of needing, uh, those needing to know God's love and his care. Um, Our family continued to go rapidly at that time, about 14 grandchildren in the same amount of years. We did well. Um, And families always remained close and connected. Families always remain close and connected, and um, an emphasis of dad's life on our li- on our in our life. And uh, uh, you know, uh, he uh, has been and still is much loved by his grandchildren. Um, he managed to hold out to his last two grand- grandchildren arrived from the U.S. before he passed away. I remember the day before him saying, "Are they are they coming? When when are they coming?" When are they coming? And they got to come and oh, say goodbye. And then he took a turn uh, after that. And, but it was this amazing moment of him waiting. 
waiting to, to do what he needed to do before he passed away. <clears throat> he spent his last few moments with his, uh, the majority of his grandchildren surrounding his bed, reading C.S. Lewis, The Last Battle, to him as he was there. And, you know, he would every now and again come, come out of his morphine stupor, stupor and kind of his eyes still had that glint of, of who he was there um, as he was surrounded by his grandchildren. And it was amazing. No one wanted to leave that moment. Nobody wanted to go. It was the most profound moment for us as, as a family as we were there with him. It was such a privilege. Um, after about 14 years um, of having Emmy, which was a long time, uh, they, they were attending this building here, actually, Light and Life, um, uh, for a little while, and uh, they really had a heart here to pray for his healing for M.E. and to see him restored to health. And um, it was amazing. About two months after, they really kind of pressed in and were like, we'd just love to see you healed from this. He began to recover, and um, he was able to come back, serve Michael, and, and uh, to, uh, to work here, assisting Michael for a little bit, which was precious, a precious time for him, Michael. It really was. And um, uh, then, um, where am I? Lost my place. Um, da -da -da. Uh, yeah. And then about a couple of, God's perfect time. It, it, it's astounding when I look at his life, God's perfect timing and all that, all that he did and all that happened. About, I don't know, not long before he was due to retire, Mum's cousin, Janet, um, died uh, leaving uh, the need for uh, Anthony to be cared for. And mum and dad didn't hesitate to, to leave everything here in Halston and go over to Golsifni and care for him and make a home for him there, um, which has been something that has been both sacrificial and beautifully conscientious when you see what they've done and how they've served and loved them. Mum and dad have never done things by halves. Whenever they do something, they do it absolutely wholeheartedly and full. And we're so grateful for that, um, for that uh, example for us to follow on in our own lives. Um, it was a little while, probably after um, going to Golsifni, that Dad uh, began to have kind of difficulty walking. And uh, it would be a little while um, before the diagnosis of motor neuron disease came about. Um, but his health and his mobility began to decrease slowly at first, but then with uh, increasing speed, uh, it began to affect. But, you know, for, for, for many of us, COVID kind of hid that journey from view for most people and uh, from those who, who knew him. And, um, but I can assure you in that time, he didn't change one bit. He didn't change one bit. He spent a long time on the phone, loving and caring and encouraging for those people who, were, who needed it at the time, the spiritual and the personal needs of other people um, continued to be uh, top of his list of things to do, even in his own deterioration and his own discomfort. He astounded everyone who came to care for him in his last uh, few months. He astounded him with his good nature, with his peace, with sometimes his awkward humor, but his perspective of heaven and his readiness to go there. Not once did we hear him complain of the discomfort that he was in. The humiliation of becoming inca incapable of caring for himself. The intensity of being trapped in a body that no longer would do what you wanted it to do. Everyone recognized the wonder of it. Not everyone recognized where it came from. His absolute certainty that he had a God-given strength for each day. A God-given strength for each day, a bright hope for tomorrow, that pain was for a moment, but that being present with the God that he loved and seeing the face of Jesus face to face would be eternal. A place where there would be no more suffering. 
and that he would be in pre- he would be present with the one that has so radically changed his life here on earth and set his course and he was content with that he was utterly content with that and i think we've all been profoundly touched by his journey uh, it has truly been a life i think uh, lived for one thing, for his God and for his glory. You know, in eulogies, sometimes you, you say all the good bits and you leave out all the bad, but I don't really think there's been a huge amount to miss out of his life. We are so thankful for his life. We are so thankful for the legacy that we as family have been given through who he was, through what he taught us. And... Uh, Many of you on your cards have written the phrase, well done, good and faithful servant. And I think that's what we can say in summary of his life and what he brought us. Thanks, Michael. I'm sure in so many ways our hearts are already encouraged and enriched. What a difference Jesus makes. When all of Christ lives in the, in the life of a person, just the wonderful difference that he makes. And uh, for all that you have shared for, for you as a family, uh, what a legacy. Uh, but we also know beyond your immediate family, as large and extensive as that is, uh, as you have already said, many enriched, many carrying something into their tomorrows because of the faith and the love of God. For certainly we valued his time here. I valued his friendship and praying with him. Uh, Just a delight. Well, his source of strength really is the theme of this next hymn that we're going to stand and sing together. Uh, There's going to be a couple more thoughts from the family just after this, but uh, this hymn, Jesus, my strength, my hope, uh, really is that celebration that Godfrey, as much as we've been thinking of him he would encourage us to think of Jesus. And this hymn was one that was, at, was sung at Godfrey and Christine's wedding. It was a hymn that was there at Godfrey's ordination service. And this has been a hymn that they have prayed together through their marriage. So let's stand and sing this hymn together. Jesus, my strength, my hope.
Do please be seated. Beautiful, beautiful hymn and prayer. Um, Danny, I think, is it you that's coming first? Great. Thank you. Firstly, uh, on behalf of our family, I'd again like to thank you all for being here with us today to remember Dad. I know some of you have traveled a long way to be here, to pay your respects, and we are very grateful to have you here with us. I'd also like to acknowledge those who would like to have joined us, um, but have gone down with COVID over the past few days, and hopefully some are able to watch via the live stream. I'd like to take some time to thank some people who have been such a great help to us during Dad's illness. The NHS have been amazing, and we have felt so supported by them. Dad had no less than eight different departments looking after his needs. We'd like to thank Rosie, Christina, Joe, Sophie, Vicky, and the many other district nurses that cared for Dad. Julie, Emma, and Tracy, the respiratory nurses. Emma, the speech and language therapist. Sinead, Dad's occupational therapist. Joff and all the staff at Marazine Surgery, consultant Dr. Varga, and those at the wheelchair service. A special thank you to Siobhan, our palliative care nurse, and Sarah, Dad's physiotherapist, who we formed a special bond with and who have become good friends. Thanks go out to close friends of Dad's who supported him with prayers, phone calls, emails, and texts often quoting encouraging words of scripture. You know who you are. It meant a great deal to him. Thanks also to those who kindly provided us with meals and baking towards the end. And a special thank you to Alan, who spent time helping us care for Dad, and also spent time in fellowship with him, reading and praying and just being there. Thank you to the Light in Life Church for hosting this service and to all those who have taken part, including those behind the scenes. Thank you to David Mitchell, our funeral director, who has been so helpful. We've heard in the eulogy about Dad's commitment to people and the time he invested in those that he crossed paths with during his life. But now we'd like to focus on what Dad meant to us as a family. The grandchildren have spent some time thinking about what Papa meant to them. And Lucy is going to read us a poem that includes some of these thoughts. Who will do it now? Papa, who will be the keeper of the flannel to protect the world from stickiness on mouths and fingers, who will laugh at Puppet's Treasure Island and watch countless na nature documentaries, st tell the most awful jokes and laugh loud every time, who will drive the car as if an aeroplane or jump hedges and fall in ditches on horsey rides, who will hold the ban on teasing, promote kindness and niceness, just by the look in your eyes? Who will give us special socks to wear to protect the sofa from our dirty feet? Or leave the bucket by the door to wash the sand off from the beach? Who will put the the hats on the eggs for breakfast or eat sticky honey and banana sandwiches with us. Memories of talks sitting by your side, game of snooker that you could always easily have won but let us win instead. Memories of running round the sofa, dancing to the orchestra with, the, with Platypus the puppet Excited and sometimes slightly scared of the fluffy animal that came alive in your hands. Who will sit and ask big questions, cause our minds to think and wonder, shape our hearts and guide our steps. 
reminding your love for Jesus. You taught how to keep him close and walk with him and talk with him. Your kindness, your fun, and your friendship, your thoughtfulness. Papa, there is a whole way you have been, but a beautiful one, full of memories and gifts. Thanks, Papa. deep breath. <laughs> there are many things that you think are normal when you're growing up that you gradually realize are not as normal as you assumed. Consistency, stability, unconditional love, kindness and attention were all things that dad gave to us as children and we took for granted. He taught us responsibility, sacrifice, thankfulness, and putting others first. And his refusal to talk negatively about others and always assume the best of people's motives and hearts set us up in a way that we are incredibly grateful for. He set standards for us and gave us boundaries when we were young. We didn't always feel that delighted about them at the time. But again, we all look back and appreciate the care and conviction on his part and a wisdom that he continued to give at every stage of our lives. In every crisis, every trouble, he taught us that there was strength to endure it, and that good would come out of it. Dad's love was also very practical, and he showed it during DIY emergencies and finding solutions to problems. He got behind our plans and dreams, working with us to help make them happen. We also want to remember that Dad was a huge amount of fun. He enjoyed indulging in the most fantastic silliness, which entertained us and any other children that were in the house at the same time on many occasions. And I know there are people here that know exactly what I'm talking about. Of course, Dad was not perfect. He would have found all these great tributes and praise for him really difficult to listen to. He had a humility and often an inability to take a compliment. But everything Dad did teach us, he endeavoured to live out himself. And this was especially seen in recent times, times of incredible discomfort, helplessness, and sometimes lack of dignity. He held his own line, never complaining, forever thankful, and still concerned for the welfare of others, often in the hardest of circumstances. So this is how we will remember Dad, knowing that his love and influence will live on in our own lives and in the lives of our children. Life won't be the same without you, Dad. We are so very grateful for you. We love you very much. Thank you. It really seems good to me from having heard from uh, the family, just to pause for a moment and pray. Uh, I know from even what Danny just said, he would want us to just turn these moments when so much has been said of him, just to turn to the Lord Jesus. So let's just pause, pray for a moment, and let's give God thanks for all that he was and all that he meant and all that he did in and through Godfrey's life. Let's, let's pray for a moment. So our loving Heavenly Father, we want to come in these moments to simply to bring our thanks to you for the uniqueness of Godfrey's life, the way you made him, the man you made him to be. We thank you for the person that he was and all that he meant to those who knew and loved him in the family and beyond. We thank you for every expression of your life, your love and grace that have been seen and experienced in him. We thank you for the husband, the dad, the granddad, the brother, the uncle, the friend you gave. We thank you for the joy, the sense of fun, the consistency, the love, the gentleness, the strength, the thoughtfulness and care for others that were found in his life. We thank you, Jesus, for all that we see of you 
in him. We thank you for his faithfulness to all that you called him and Christine to as you strengthened and enabled them. And Father, this afternoon, we want to say thank you for every way his life touched and impacted those around him. For the blessings, the encouragement, the words of wisdom his life was to those who knew and loved him. Father, for all your loving purposes, for all your grace-shaped, loving heart that was seen in him and through him. Father, we bring our thanks to you. And Lord, in these moments, I just want to pray for, for Christine and for all the family for all the loved ones and friends who mourn and grieve and feel the loss. Father, I ask that you may comfort them in the promise of your word, even as we read it at the start, that, that nothing, not even death, can separate us from the love of God through faith in Jesus. So I pray, Lord, you would, help, would you help each one to find comfort and to experience that strength from you through Jesus Christ our Lord in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to stand and sing our next hymn, As You're Able, Will Your Anchor Hold uh, in the Storms of Life? And then after the singing of this hymn, David will come and bring a reading uh, before Andy then comes and brings a, a message from the Bible for us this afternoon. So as you're able, let's stand and sing this next hymn together.
say slightly to the tributes that have been given that uh, Godfrey and I became very close friends starting around 1976. And I can only say that through all of the years since, and even after my family and I moved to London, um, nobody could ever have been a more loyal, faithful, loving, and encouraging friend. And there were many times when he encouraged me when I felt down, many times when he encouraged me in the ongoing work of ministry. And I'm grateful to God for all that his loyal friendship, and it was loyal friendship, has meant in all of those years, even after we moved up to London. We're going to turn now to the Word of God in the Scripture and two passages that uh, meant a lot to Godfrey in these months when he was suffering so much. And the first one comes from the Gospel of John, John chapter 14, and reading from verse 1 to verse 6. John writes, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way. You know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then another reading from the prophet Isaiah in one of his visions of the very end of time in this present age and the restoration of all things. Isaiah chapter 25, I'm reading from verse 6 to verse 9. Isaiah writes, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich blood, of rich food, full of marrow, of aged wine, well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Amen. Um, and it was lovely to hear what, the, what you had to say and what the children said as well. It was really lovely. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to embarrass da- Danny a little bit by just thanking him for giving up his job and uh, taking care of his dad. I think we need to pray. <laughs> Let's all pray. It's a, it's a hymn that was a very precious hymn to, to our friend, Godfrey, to our Let's pray in the words of this hymn. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with love divine. Until this earthly part of me glows with thy fire divine. Breathe on me, breath of God. So shall I never die, but live with thee the perfect life of thine eternity. Amen. Well, we're united uh, here this afternoon uh, in our grief, uh, which is as sharp as a thorn and as bitter as vinegar. We feel a terrible sense of loss. Our our lives will be the lesser through the leaving of, of Godfrey. So we join together, we come together 
we share this united grief together. And we thank God we've, we've also been able to give thanks to God and we, to really give thanks to him and to share together. And thank you so much for the readings. Sharing together the, the person that he was and uh, what he has done for so many of us here. And I can add my two penny worth to that as well. Um, so very often he was a great encouragement uh, to me uh, personally and to our, uh, to our family. We also thank God particularly for his prayers. He, he once said to me, we didn't meet each other very often, once or twice a year. He once said to me, I pray for you every day. I thought, hmm. I don't think I can uh, reciprocate that one. <laughs> uh, but he was a, yeah, he was a man of prayer. He realized, you see, that um, when we pray for others, we are most like Jesus. Because Jesus, what does he do? He ever lives to make intercession. His prayers are for others. Jesus never prays for himself. He prays for others. So when we pray for others, we, we're most like our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a text that was read as part of the reading from Isaiah 25 uh, was uh, shared, was precious to Godfrey and was shared among us uh, in the past few weeks. Uh, Isaiah 26 and verse 8, which is also quoted uh, by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, 15 and verse 54. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. What is your, your response to that? How, how do you uh, react to that, that statement? Death is swallowed up in victory. Do you, do you feel uh, incredulous? Really? Death? Death, grim as it is, permanent, parting, horrible as it is. Death, swallowed up in victory, doesn't seem real. Are we being real? Is this just religious fantasy? Well, these words are preceded. These words, uh, the Lord uh, will swallow up death forever. The words we find in Isaiah are preceded by three words. Which, which convert that uh, statement from kind of wishful thinking and hoping for the best and religious kind of uh, uh, speculation uh, into a reality. And those three words are in this mountain, or on this mountain, God will swallow up death forever. And this was a prophecy. Isaiah was saying something that is going to happen. And like many prophecies, uh, there's more than one fulfillment. But the most important thing that this was pointing towards uh, was that on, there would be a mountain. There would be a mountain, and upon that mountain, death would be swallowed up. And uh, that, mount, that mountain was, uh, was, was not a green hill far away, as it happens, it, it was a hill. It was far away, but probably not a green hill. It was, uh, it was in the shape of a skull, a grim place outside the city wall. And it was a hill called uh, Golgotha. And that was where death was swallowed up. You've got a lovely hill. The children, uh, we love to see it when we come down here. Uh, it's St. Michael's Mount. And uh, we went there quite recently, last summer, and it's beautiful. You can see it from lots of vantage points, can't you? You can stand at Marazine and just let, look out to, to, uh, to, to the St. Michael's Mount. And uh, I mustn't digress into memories at this point. Uh, but I want you to imagine, and instead of on the top of the mount, instead of being able to see uh, a, a, a castle, a, a priory, an old priory that's been made into a castle, Instead of being able to see that, that on St. Michael's Mount, in your mind, you can see three crosses. And on the middle central cross, 
There is Jesus, the Son of God, and he's been nailed to the cross. Can you see that? Can you picture that in your mind? On either side of him there are two thieves, two criminals, who have also been uh, being, suffering this terrible punishment of being crucified. Can you picture that? It's awful, isn't it? What's happening? What's going on? Well, the two criminals are paying for the crimes they have done. You might say they're paying a terrible price uh, for just being thieves. But that's what they're paying for. They're paying for the crimes that they, they've done. But what crime is Jesus praying for? Can anybody tell me the answer to that? What crimes are, is Jesus praying for? Yeah? Our what? Our crimes. Our crimes. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Spot on. He was paying for the crimes that we have done. The crimes against God that we have committed. Our sins and transgressions against God. Jesus was paying that for us. He was paying for our crimes. And the, 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 the punishment that the law, the, the law and justice of God uh, 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 prescribes upon our sins. What is the punishment of that? What is the punishment for our sins? The punishment is death. And, it, and separation from God. That's the punishment for the sins uh, that we have committed, the crimes against God that we've all committed, every one of us uh, have committed. But Jesus was taking that punishment and that, that sentence upon himself as if he was guilty of all that we have done wrong. He took it upon himself. So what happened to him? He died. He died, the punishment for sin, you see, was death, and so he died. And what happened to him in the darkness when the sun refused to shine? What happened then? What did he say? My God, my God, what, why have you forsaken me? He was separated from God. You see what he was doing on that middle cross? You can see it there? There, there was Jesus, and he was taking the punishment for our sins. Death. Separation from God. How very, very much he must have loved us. Yeah? How very much. What kind of love. Wesley said one time, uh, looking at the cross, he said, Oh, love divine, what have you done? What have you done? The Father's Son should die. The Father's beloved and lovely Son, the Lord Jesus, that he should die. But he did. See what he did? He took our sin upon himself and he died for us. He died our death. So what did he do? He swallowed up. He swallowed up our death himself. So there need be no more death for us. No more separation from God. Because he did that. Because he swallowed up death. Then what happened? Here's another question for you. Still, still with us. Um, what happened on the third day after Jesus died? He rose from the dead. No hesitation. Brilliant. He, 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 was, he rose from the dead, didn't he? He came alive again. That, that, that was... You know, that was bound to happen, wasn't it? It had to happen. Because uh, death couldn't hold him anymore. Because he'd conquered death. He swallowed death up. And so, he rose again from the dead on the third day in victory. See, it was on that mountain that, that God, that death was swallowed up in victory. What are, how does that help us uh, this afternoon? Well, you might remember that Mary, remember Mary when she was in the garden and uh, she went to find the body of Jesus and uh, it was gone. 
and she was weeping. She was inconsolable. They've taken him away. They've taken him away, she said, weeping. And then she saw this man, didn't she? Thought he was the gardener, asked him where the body had been laid. What did he say to her? Mary. Mary. And she said to him, Rabboni! She, she fell down at his feet and she, she, she wept and she, she held on to him. See how Jesus comforted her uh, as he came back from, from the dead. And we need to hear that voice ourselves. We need to hear that today. Only the voice of Jesus can bring that kind of comfort. He comes to us. One of Godfrey's favourite hymns was from William Cooper, and it has these words at the beginning. Hark my soul. Listen. It is the Lord. It is the Lord. Tis your Saviour. Hear his word. Jesus speaks and speaks to thee. Oh, that those who, who are grieving might hear that word of Jesus, that he might speak to you, speak comfort and speak peace. He says to you, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. I died. I died for you. And I died for the one that you loved. And in dying, I made death of no effect, says Jesus. And listen, I'm alive. I'm alive forevermore and I live. I live to be with you. That's the Mount of Crucifixion where Jesus, Jesus died. So that's where death was swallowed up in victory. But it's not just something that happened in the past. It's something that happens now. Death is now swallowed up uh, in victory. Because our problem is that we are sinners. As we were thought, thought a moment ago uh, about our crimes against God. And that's our problem is that we are sinners. And because we are sinners we have a kind of spiritual death. It's as though we just can't see the things of God. We can't hear the voice of God. Uh, and and we, we can't know the life of God, spiritual life. We can't really pray uh, to God. And all of this is because we are spiritually dead ourselves. Well, we've heard something this afternoon about the the story of how Godfrey came to know the Lord Jesus. Had you heard that one before? It was when he was very young, actually. Is there anybody here? How, how old was he? Was it four or? I can't remember. Nine. You're nine, yeah. He was ten. Yeah, he was ten. I think that was the time when he first started to come to know Jesus. Um, and then, uh, a bit later, old, when he was older, when he was 17, uh, something else happened. Uh, so this is how he described it himself. This, these are the words of Godfrey in his poem. He said, When into early adulthood I came, full grown and yet essentially the same, my life remained corrupted at the root, right at the depths, wrong, rotten, sinful, and blighted in its branches and in its fruit. The problem hadn't gone away, the problem of sin. But then, he says, then the most wonderful thing took place when God in pity turned to me his face and from his presence flew a heavenly dove and lighted on my head with wings of love. Then, a heavenly message came to my ears. The gospel I had puzzled on for years. Its pieces now were falling into place. Salvation, not of works, but grace, all of grace. 
and he, he's writing this 30 years later, and he says this, and though some 30 years have gone their way, I still remember it as yesterday, when, as the rising of the sun, of the morning sun, my darkness scattered and my light uh, was come. What had happened? Well, spiritual death uh, was swallowed up in victory. Uh, the life of God by the Holy Spirit came to live uh, in him. God's gift to him. God loved him. God had pity on him. God loves, God cares, God has pity upon us. And he, he gives us the gift of eternal life. It's not something that we can earn for ourselves. It's something we receive from him as a gift. And you know, it's for all of you. It's for all of us. One of Godfrey's favorite hymns includes these words. The arms of love that compass me would all mankind embrace. It's for all. The, the salvation of Christ is for all, for all who will believe, for all who will be trust, put their trust in him. There is no exception. There is no one who, who is outside of his love, outside of his grace. If you will come to him, he will receive you with the arms of love as a returning prodigal. Mary's tears were of, of sorrow were turned into tears of joy. And so it was that tears of repentance, oh God, I've sinned against you. I've done evil in your sight. Oh God, tears of repentance Lord, please change my life. Please forgive my sin. Tears of repentance were turned into tears of joy. See, God wiping away tears isn't just something that happens when we get to heaven. It's something that happens now as well. It may happen for each one of you. May the Lord wipe away the tears from your eyes and bring comfort to your hearts. But there's one final thing uh, to see. I'm missing a lot out. Um, there's one final thing to see. Uh, and that it is this. Yes, death was swallowed up in victory at Golgotha. Death is being swallowed up in victory now in the lives of those who come to know the Lord Jesus and receive his gift of life uh, into the, their own lives. But also, finally... Finally, death, death will be swallowed up in victory. See, when the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world to save us and to redeem us, he, he came to deal with all the dire effects of the fall. Uh, the fall is when we fell into sin, and as, as a result of that fall into sin, uh, all the woes and sorrows the guilt and the condemnation uh, came upon uh, us, came upon this world because of the fall of man into sin. But Jesus came as the Redeemer. He came to, so that we could regain uh, paradise. And he came to deal with all the effects uh, of the fall. And that includes the effects of the fall into sin upon our bodies. What are they? We know them only too well, don't we? Disability, a life blighted by disability, by handicap, mental, physical, disease. Godfrey knew something of that more than most people. How that affects our lives, how, how it takes away the, the enjoyment of life. It brings pain and, and difficulty and misery into our lives. And of course then for every one of us. But my dad was incredibly healthy. He hardly ever went into hospital. Only once, I think. Um, he lived to be 93. Um, but eventually, 
age catches up, doesn't it? We are all subject to aging, uh, and then eventually we come to breathe our last and to die. And our bodies deteriorate. It's very sad to see, isn't it? It was awful for, to see this, to see that body becoming more and more frail and weak and dying. But Jesus came to deal with that. Uh, and there is something called the adoption. There is something called the redemption of the body. See, it says in Romans 8 that the whole creation, all of creation is groaning in pain until now. But what is it waiting for? It's waiting for something to happen. Creation, the trees, the, the skies, the hills, everything in creation, the, the birds, the, the animals, they're groaning and they're groaning and they're waiting for something to happen. What are they waiting for? They're waiting for the adoption of the son, the children of God when finally we are taken home eternally to be with the Lord. What happens then? It's something called the redemption of the body. Yes, Jesus died to save our bodies, our, our decaying, diseased bodies. Uh, he died to give us new bodies. What's going to happen? Well, one day, the trumpet will sound uh, for his coming. One day, the voice of the Lord will be heard, the voice of Jesus from heaven. And when Jesus speaks, and when that trumpet sounds, all those who are in the graves will be raised from death raised from death. And those who've died trusting in the Lord Jesus will be raised to be like him, like him. They will have a body. Their, their, their body will be raised from the dead and, and, and recreated or created anew to have an eternal, spiritual, but, but also physical body like the body of Jesus when he rose from the dead. This is a, an astonishing thing. But we have his word for it. We have his, his uh, uh, precedent for it because he himself rose from the dead. Well, those of us who... So, 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 so those who have died will be raised from the dead uh, and uh, they'll be given their new bodies and, they'll, and the Lord Jesus will bring them with him. That's what's going to happen. He's going to bring Godfrey with him in his new body his resurrection body, when Jesus comes uh, again. And if we're still here when, when Jesus returns, then in, an, in a twinkling of an eye, in an instant, we will be changed. We'll suddenly be changed. Those who tr trust and love the Lord Jesus will be changed and we will be caught up together uh, to meet them all in the air. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glory will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved ones bringing. Glorious Saviour, this Jesus is mine. And Paul, this is what Paul says concerning that. He says, then, then will be brought to pass the saying that is written. Then, death is swallowed up victory. What a hope this is. How it is that God will then wipe away the tears from our eyes. And may this hope, this hope of eternal life, be a, a consolation and a comfort to our grieving hearts. A few weeks ago before he went to be with the Lord, Godfrey wrote these words. I'd like to finish now with these words and uh, let Godfrey have the last say. So this is Godfrey speaking uh, to us all here this afternoon. I am shortly to leave this earth for heaven, not because I deserve to, but entirely by God's grace. My faithful Mortal body will be reverently laid into the ground and my spirit will have gone to be with my Lord Jesus Christ 
and all the company of the redeemed who have already arrived there, saved by Christ's precious blood. For in Jerusalem, where Jesus died upon the cross, he swallowed up death forever. And there in heaven, we shall await his new creation, including immortal physical bodies in which we shall serve him with adoring love, joy, and utmost pleasure. This is his is final word. Now listen, listen to this. Let's, let's all listen to this. Dear reader, he says, do not delay. In love, Jesus, the Son of God, is calling you. Do not ignore him. Do not resist him. Do not reject him. To do so is to, to spurn the love of God to you and to continue on a suicidal trajectory that will inevitably lead you into an eternal hell of regret. Turn to him. Trust him. Give your heart to him while he gives you time. There's an opportunity now to respond to, uh, to those words as we sing the next hymn on the program. Uh, it's a wonderful hymn, Just As I Am, Without One Plea, but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come.
Let's finish our service of thanksgiving this afternoon with a prayer. Uh, Do please feel free to sit down. It's absolutely fine. I understand that this hymn that we have just sung was one that was being sung when God responded in faith and came to Jesus and committed his life to him. And uh, what wonderful words, just as I am, thou will receive, will welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise, I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. What a way that you and I, if you've never done so, could even respond to this same Lord Jesus who made all the difference in the world to Godfrey's life. Let's, uh, let's finish our service with a prayer. So gracious God, our loving, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence with us in this special time. Thank you for your grace towards Godfrey. Thank you for this love of yours that, that broke into his life and shaped the whole of his life. Thank you for all the grace and love of yours that we've seen in him. We again, Lord, just want to commend to you Christine and the whole family. May this love, this immeasurable love of Jesus comfort and keep you in these days to come. And our Father in heaven, may all that you are, good, gracious, loving, present, faithful, strong, wise, may all that you are, our mighty God, be to all the family and loved ones, all that they need for their good, and all that will make known your glory. And so the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to say thank you so much for being here in this special service of thanksgiving. Uh, again, just want to say that on behalf of the family, thank you for those of you who have joined with us online during this service indeed, whether next door or indeed from home. Uh, we, we need to finish, I believe, the live broadcast here for playing a song, uh, I think actually for copyright reasons. So just thank you for joining us, those of you who have done so live or online. And we're simply going to play one more song that we'll get to be able to listen to here in the hall. It's a song that, uh, that Godfrey uh, meant a lot to him. He requested that it would be played uh, at the end of this Thanksgiving service. It's called Sweet Beulah Land. And if you don't know, Beulah is an Old Testament reference to being in heaven with Jesus. So uh, we're going to listen to this and then I'll just say one or two words before some of you will leave or before we take some time in refreshments together. But if we could play this song, that would be great. Thank you guys.
sing it again (laughs) it's beautiful isn't it I hear the singing a brand new song of joy divine Uh, we have been reminded because of Jesus uh, Godfrey without doubt who loved hymns in this life is learning a brand new song of joy divine again just thank you so much for being here today If you do need to leave, we're going to open these doors at the front. Do feel free to to use those. Of course, if you're nearer the back, it may just be as easy for you to slip out the doors, those main doors at the front. Um, We're going to be serving refreshments. Uh, We're going to be bringing uh, pasties and saffron buns into different places in the hall. So, uh, again, just if you are able to stay, just uh, head to the nearest table, I guess, is the easiest thing to say. On a practical note, if you, if you need a gluten-free pasty, we have those, but you will need to go into the foyer for those. So if you do need a gluten-free one, we have them, but please go to the foyer. And then in a little while, uh, when you've had a pasty and a saffron bun, then you'll be able to get a tea or coffee or a, or a juice out in the foyer. If you do need, uh, what shall I say, if you need the loo uh, out through these double doors on the left and down to the corridor, uh, the gents and, and the ladies and indeed an accessible toilet is there as well. So just to, to point you in that direction as well. But the Lord bless you. Thank you so much for being here. And Lord, we just thank you for your goodness and grace. Bless you.